the definition and method of inspiration. Um, last time in our study on inspiration, we had our positive affirmation, didn't we, on the declaration of Scripture and what it says about itself and how it says that it is the Word of God. And um, we made the point, did we not, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is breathed out by God. And we made the point that it was not by the will of man, but by the will of God that that took place. And we showed, and I hope that everybody left last time, those that were here, sure in their minds that the Bible clearly claims that every single word is important, that every single word that we find in the original manuscripts what came from God through his Holy Spirit. And we called that verbal plenary inspiration. The words were completely inspired. Now, unfortunately, as we all know, um, being in the minority in this culture that we are in, that understanding, that belief, has certainly come under attack. We've had the higher critics, we've had science, we've had other Christians, and unfortunately parts of our own community pushing against that very clear belief that we as Christadelphians have. And so this evening, God willing, we are going to look at some of the passages that we could unfortunately look at and that could cause us to doubt, potentially, the very clear and the very positive statements that we find in God's word. And we'll come on to that in a moment. The last study next week, God willing, will be on, of course, the application of our understanding and appreciation of God's word. So as we say, a quick recap from last time, we looked at three positive statements. Inspiration is the process by which God caused the scriptures to be written. The result of inspiration was the revelation of the words of God, and inspiration was outside the will of man. And as we mentioned, this was called verbal plenary inspiration. Every word absolutely inspired, inerrant and infallible. So that's the Bible's claim. The word of God is true. When the Bible speaks on a subject, it speaks truth. It is a true word. And we'd expect that because the God of the Bible is a God of truth. This time, what are we going to look at? We're going to look at, I mean, just a little caveat. We can't deal with every single potential passage that someone might ever have a problem with. So I've had to try and group them into kind of big chunks um, of, of subject. And we're going to try and do our very best to, to give and provide some sort of answer to common issues that we might come across. So we'd like to look at literary, literacy style and personality. We'd like to look at scientific fact, historical fact, human sources, and personal thoughts and emotions that we might assume are expressed in the text before us. Now, these are delicate subjects. These are powerful subjects. Uh, but I do believe that it's important that we get to grips with some of these things. Because as I've mentioned, in our very community, these are being voiced in certain parts to damage our understanding of verbal plenary inspiration. And so that's why we've got to deal with them, unfortunately. So let's kick off then. Literacy, style, and personality. How do we explain if every single word, every single expression in the scripture has been given by God under his Holy Spirit guidance, how do we explain different styles that we come across? Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I understand, for example, that that Luke and Acts are written in a spe specific kind of Greek, which is different to how Peter is written. That's one example. Let me show you some more. Look at this. This is, I don't know if you can see that at the back. Hopefully you can. We've got, a few, we've got to get a bit into the text this week, so I, I, I did the best I could to make it as big as I could. So bear with if you can't, but I'll, I'll try and refer to the relevant bits. In John 3, for example, it says, For God sent not his Son into the world. And in 1 John 4, that's the epistle of John, we have the same word order. God sent his only begotten Son into the world. And so critics say, well, this is a demonstration or an example of literacy style because this phrase and word order and thought is unique to the writings of John. 
And so they say, well, there we go. Maybe John was constrained by his own thought process, by the, his own words of expression. And so that's why, that would explain why, though in John, we find this phrase. Well, is that the case? And how does that fit with our understanding of verbal plenary inspiration? Every word given by God. If John's own expressions could come forward in the text. How about this one? Um, if you've, we've recently done a study on Mark, and it's interesting, isn't it, isn't it, how Mark seems to always be in a rush, doesn't he? He uses the word immediately, all the way through, just pick up chapter one, immediately the spirit, immediately his fame, immediately the fever, and it goes all the way through, and you can see on the bottom there, the passages in Mark that have this phrase, immediately, like Mark was an impatient man, and that's what the critics will say. They will say, we've looked at this text, and because of this type of expression, that tells us Mark was incredibly impatient, he was always in a rush, and he was very dramatic. And they conclude various things based on that reasoning. And we can go a little bit further with this. Look at this. This is, um, this is Dr. Luke. So, uh, so, so Luke's called the beloved physician, isn't he, in Colossians 4.14. So we know Luke was a doctor. And interestingly, it is pointed out that Luke is the only gospel writer to record Jesus' statements about physicians. He's the only one to record that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day, and he's the only one to record the parable of the Good Samaritan with its medical connections. And so, scholars will say, well, look, um, of course Luke would point all this stuff out, because he was a physician, and so he could choose to, to put that and, and would notice these things and put it in the text. But hold on a second, didn't we see from our first study that the word that we read has not come by the will of man. It's come by the will of God. So how do we fit that with our understanding of verbal plenary inspiration? And here's another one just based on Luke. This, was, um, this is one suggestion I came across. So in Luke 8, we have the record of the woman with the issue of blood. And that reads, and a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. So Luke records it quite matter of fact. But look at what Mark says in the Gospel of Mark. This woman had suffered many things of many physicians and spent all that she had and was nothing bettered but rather grew worse. And so the commentators, or at least some of them, say, well, look, of course Mark's, Mark's got it right, but Luke wanting to protect his fellow doctors, you know, chose not to, to say practically that physicians in this case were a waste of time and money. So is that the case? Did Luke in fact restrain that information and, and maybe did he add little bits that he wanted to add when he was observing medical based conditions in the gospel? I refer you back to our first talk and I would suggest to you that that way of reasoning suggesting that Luke could control the text, that Mark could control the text, that John could control the text, is completely against the holy claim of Scripture, which was that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. All of those things that we've mentioned are pure assumption. It's assumption that these writers had a style. Now, how, do we, how can we say that? Well, I'll tell you this, if we had uninspired writings from, for example, Luke, then we, could make, then we could make that comparison. What about uninspired writings from Mark? If we had an uninspired book that turned up that was written by Mark, which we do not have, we could see whether he was in fact an impatient person because it would be reflected in that book. But we do not have external, uninspired sources to compare, do we? And so all we can go on is what the scripture says. The scripture says these words, um, these writers were compelled by God to write these things down. But nevertheless, we still have these distinctions which are made, which we have to accept. 
So we would have to say that if they are there, they are there by design of God Almighty. Not because that author decided to add something extra or take something out. They are there because God meant for that to happen. God designed it. The God of truth. He is in control. And as we said last week, it may or it may not have been something that that writer wanted or did not want to even say. The writer, as we showed last week, may not have even understood what they were writing. I mean, it seems unlikely though, doesn't it? But that's, that's the clear teaching of Scripture. All we know is that this is the word of God and not the words of man. And he controls and chooses the words used. Now we'll come on and elaborate that a little bit more because it may well have been that that word order was also the word order, for example, that John used, was also something that was something that he would have expressed naturally without inspiration. But the primary thing for us to focus on here is that the word of God is God's word. And so if John had been raised up and spoke in that way, it was by design of God. God is in control of all things. And that's very different from the perspective of those that would cause us to doubt our understanding of inspiration, that the author chooses their own words and expressions and is limited by their linguistic ability and knowledge. And we mentioned this last time, uh, this idea that the idea has been uh, given to the penman by God, but in fact, the penman could choose what to put in and what to leave out. They could choose the words. They could choose what they wanted to do. That's very different to the words and the expressions being the choice of God and being deliberate. And that's very different to saying that any personality that we do come across in Scripture is there by design of God and may or may not reflect that of the author. As I say, we can only go on the clear, positive statements that the Bible clearly teaches us about how its word should be regarded. Now, we're going to develop that a little bit further in, our, in, in, a, couple of, um, in a couple of kind of uh, our next difficult chunks of passages. Now, this is a big one, scientific fact. Of course, we live in an age of science. Science, of course, meaning understanding. And I would suggest to you that the Bible is fully in accord, in harmony, with observable science. True science, as we would maybe dub it. Science that is repeatable, science that we can observe and know for sure that that is the case. Where we get into complications with science is when a scientist who looks at something today assumes that whatever they're observing has always been that way. And so the scientist has what, what's called the uniformity. It's like it's always been that way, so it's, it's, been, it's a uniform uh, system that they're looking at. That's what they assume. But we believe in the supernatural. We believe God is outside of the laws of nature. We believe God controls those laws and that he, in fact, created those laws. So why we would assume that God would, uh, would, would be constrained by his very creation, I do not understand. He can change things. So we have to bear that very strong um, concept in mind, that if we believe in an almighty, all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing God, then of course he understands his creation. And of course he can't, he's not going to be constrained within the remits of the laws that he has set. So just bear that in mind when we come then to the account of creation. So... The Bible is very clear. Um, God ended his work of creation on the seventh day. He ended it. It doesn't continue on into uh, infinity. It's stopped. We have passages, for example, in Exodus. In six days, the Lord Yahweh made heaven and earth. And of course, we don't only just have that. Um, our brother Bernard Burt in Coventry West, I think he's got a, a spreadsheet he sent me a while back. There's over 200 passages in the New Testament to Genesis 1 to 5. And therefore, if we start messing about with Genesis 1 to 5, we have to untangle 
200 or passages in the New Testament. The Bible is very clear about the creation that we are living in, that it was um, done in six days, approximately 7,000 years ago. Now, I know that sounds probably bizarre to a scientist. They think we're naive, they think we're stupid, but we believe in the supernatural. They believe in uniformity. uniformity. They believe and have faith that what they measure today has always been that way. Now, that is faith because they were not there at the so-called Big Bang. And not only that, they have to have faith that nothing plus nothing equals everything, which I would suggest to you is a logical um, uh, fallacy. So they have faith in those things, and obviously we could elaborate on that, um, but that is not the purpose of this talk. For now, we want to just look at some difficult passages. I'd like us to please turn to Genesis chapter 1, because within um, the, uh, the, of course, the realms of science, they scorn these passages in Genesis, and unfortunately that has affected the Christian world, particularly Christians who wish to mix and rub shoulders with academia. They do not wish to be laughed at in our universities. And so some have come to the text and sought to find doubt in actually what is being expressed in order to perhaps say it was mythical, it was maybe um, some sort of uh, vision rather than real reality and historical narrative. Now, we actually did a class on the firmament last year that um, I'm sure many people uh, turned up to. If not, I'm sure there's, um, there's some recordings we could perhaps get hold of for you. So we've done a whole hour on this concept of the firmament. I'm just going to touch on some key areas. Because what has been proposed is that the author, constrained by their understanding of the universe around them, in fact, although had the idea that they should record something about creation, unfortunately, was recording this. They were recording this idea of a dome that appears above the earth with the stars pinned into the sides of it which, it is postulated, is what the ancients, particularly in Mesopotamia, believed at this time. Now, in our last talk, we showed that, in fact, the academics do not agree that that is what the ancients believed around that time was the construction of their cosmos. But we need to, to deal with this. So, at first, you think, well, this is pretty bizarre. Let me show you something. So, um, if you actually look at Genesis chapter 1, I just want to, to show you the problems that we might have of a simple reading of this text. In verse 1 it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And I suggest to you that's like the header statement. That's like in the newspaper, God created the heaven and the earth. And then we get the events leading up to the creation of the heaven and the earth. The heaven is defined um, in verse 8 and the earth is defined later um, uh, in verse 10. And, of course, the record then, if, if we've got that correct, starts in verse 2, that the earth was without form and void. So it is possible that the earth itself was a lot older. It is possible, like Brother Thomas suggests, that there was other things happening on the earth before our human uh, and creation that we see around us took place, and that maybe it had been wiped out. That's a pure assumption. All we know is in verse 2, it says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So water was there. So it seems what is being described to us is the earth is there, it's, it's covered in water. It's void, it's waste, there's nothing living on it. It's, it's, it's just kind of floating there. And then, of course, God's spirit moves on the face of the waters. Now, these waters are significant because we read that in verse 6, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So we have uh, water, and then we have something called the firmament that's put in between. So we have waters above, as they're called, um, and we have waters beneath. And we read in verse 8 that God called this firmament, whatever it is, heaven. What's suggested is, is that is talking, that the Hebrew is rakur, that that is talking about some sort of firm-like shell. And so above this firm-like firmament shell is um, like a cosmic water 
And we're in like this bubble, right, underneath it. And that's what is being suggested is what is being said here. And the reason that that is um, being suggested is because um, if you look at verse, um, verse 7, it says this. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And then if you jump to verse 20, it says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly, and the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament. Or in the Hebrew, it literally renders, in front of the firmament. So... We have this firmament. In front of the firmament, we have fowls flying. The birds are flying. And we think, no problem. But then when you get to verse 14, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, this is a problem because the waters are above the firmament. And suddenly we're, re we're, we're reading, it seems, that stars are inside the firmament. So we have stars. Is, is this saying that we have stars under the clouds? Because the birds then fly also in front of the, the firmament. And this is, of course, a complication if we believe that God himself has inspired these words to teach us of the reality of his creation. And so it's suggested we can throw Genesis 1 out and also Genesis 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and, and we might stop at 10 if you're lucky. Now what's the answer to this? Well, as I say, we dealt with this last time. I would suggest to you very strongly that there are two firmaments being described here. Okay, there's the one in verse, um, in verse 6, which God uh, produces at creation, and in verse 8, he calls that firmament heaven. So we have the firmament which is called heaven. But the Hebrew in verse 14, which talks about the heavens where the stars are, is very different. It says, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven, not the firmament called heaven slightly different and of course it makes complete sense if you have that understanding because in verse 20 the fowls fly in front of the firmament of heaven now let me just sort of try and show you that on the screen um, we have the earth and the waters under the firmament in genesis 1 verse 7 the firmament called heaven in genesis 1 verse 8 and incidentally you'll find um, in, oh, I'll come on to that in a minute. We have the, the waters above the firmament, which are the clouds, in Genesis 1, verse 7. And then we have the firmament of the heavens in Genesis 1, verse 15. And so that is in perfect accordance and harmony with the reality of creation that we know. And as, as, as we've put on the right-hand side, and we did in our last study, you can go to very, a lot of other passages in the Bible which talk about there being two heavens, as it were, the heaven and the heaven of heavens. And we read in um, the Proverbs and in Psalms that the clouds are called the waters above. And so we have a, 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 a complete understanding of that. And then the fowls pop in there in front of the firmament uh, called heaven, uh, the firmament of the heavens there. And it makes complete sense. And it, in, just notice, because this will come up later, if this is the case, which we strongly suggest it is, this is um, relative to us on the earth. The fowls are in front of the firmament of the heavens. And that makes um, sense to somebody stood on the earth. We'll move on to some other things. Modern science scoffs at the idea of Adam, doesn't it? And the fall. But as we've said, the New Testament's very clear. The first man, Adam, it says in 1 Corinthians 15. Or could the biblical writers be mistaken? Could they be constrained by their own understanding of, of, of their scientific world of their day? And this, I think, is where it gets very serious. Because if you believe in evolution and the scientific so-called view then you have to believe that the human race evolved from, from millions of years. And you have to believe that death existed in the human race for millions of years, because that's how evolution worked over generation and generation. 
and that death existed there before sin. Now, of course, that's a major problem for us, isn't it? Because we believe that the consequences of Adam's sin was death. In that very day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The process of death set in at that point of, um, of sin. And of course, we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, as the perfect representative of man who bore our nature, who died, and who in the righteousness of God rose again, he also reversed, well, he reversed the effects of Adam's transgressional sin to reconcile us again with God. Now, I'd suggest to you all of those things are under threat if we accept theistic evolution or evolution full stop. It totally contradicts the biblical account, so we have problems with inspiration. I'm going to move on because uh, we, could, we could talk about that for some time. So, propagators of this idea that the author was constrained by their own understanding of history and science and language will point out that, you know what, in the Bible, doesn't it say that the heart is the place that thinks inside a human? And of course, that's what the ancients believed. That's why it's in the text. And modern science has come along and cut out hearts. And now we know that it's a pump that simply pumps the blood around the body. So is this an example? And it often is brought as an example of the ancients and the penmen of the, write, of the writing of the scripture being constrained by their own understanding. Why did not God, if he inspired every single word of scripture, explain to the ancients that it was in fact in their brains that these things took place? The poor ancient people didn't have that. Now, that understanding. Now, to, for us to answer questions like this, it sounds very plausible on the surface, doesn't it? Yeah, crumbs, how do we deal with that? But what we have always do, brothers and sisters, particularly in this ecclesia, do we not, is for us to understand divine meaning, we seek to have and, and look at divine usage. So we see how the words are used, and that, on that authority, it gives us the meaning. Not because we have injected a medical term or meaning onto the text, but because we know that is how God uses that word. And so on that authority, we glean meaning from the text. Now, when you actually go through and look at the Hebrew word leb, which is translated heart, you will find it never, at least to my knowledge, ever explains uh, and is used as a piece of anatomy, like a, like a pump that, bloods, uh, that pumps blood around. That's not how God uses the word leb. When God uses the word leb, he uses it as an expression of something that's in the center of something. Okay? So like the center of the earth. That's the word heart in Hebrew, leb. It's got a wider semantic range than some sort of medical textbook exposition of that word. And so what we find when we go through scripture is we read that people speak in their heart. The, their, heart their hearts faint. They're wise-hearted. The heart stirred them up. They hated their brother in their heart. We read that they considered things in their heart, that hearts can be deceived, that words can be stored there, that hearts can be wicked, that they can imagine things, that they can reason, that they can think, etc., etc. And when you read it with the understanding that that's talking about the center of the person, it makes complete sense. But consider this. If we start reading it to mean an actual physical blood pump, think about this as if the author is constrained by their understanding of the heart being the thinking seat of the human body. Think about these expressions when it says, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Now, are we saying that because the poor person constrained to write the scriptures had an understanding that the heart was the seat of knowledge, that they also thought that this heart could be hardened. Of course not. It means the core of Pharaoh, metaphorically speaking, figuratively speaking, was, was hardened. He was hard-hearted. In Ezekiel we read that Israel have a stony heart of flesh. 
They didn't believe that hearts were made of stone in the ancient days. In Joshua, we read the heart melts. Saul's heart, uh, we read, trembled. David's heart smote him. These are figures of speech that make sense if we look at divine usage of the word. The heart is a word. The meaning is placed on it by scripture, not by man. It came about through the will of man. It's not a medical term. So that's how we can answer questions like that. We have to do our Bible study. And we have to come at it with the teachableness of a little child. And we have to look at what the Bible claims about inspiration, not what we think it might mean. And that's the difference. And that's the danger by taking up some of these approaches which seem to undermine our understanding of inspiration. Now, we've got a few more on this one. This is the biggest section, so bear with me, because it's such a a, a relevant section to us. What about these ones? So we've got the sun arising, and they go, there there you go. The ancients thought the sun literally rose in the earth, Um, which, of course, we know it's not. It's the earth rotates, and the sun is where it is, and so it appears to be rising. From where? From the position of somebody on the earth. So it's relative, Is that a true statement that the sun rises? Yes, it is, if you're stood on the earth, because that's that's a true statement. It's not that there's error in the Bible. It's relative. This is the same here with, with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. When he talks about the mustard seed, he says it's the smallest of all the seeds. And it's pointed out that, no, it's not the smallest of all the seeds. The seed's far smaller than the mustard seed. But but Jesus, perhaps, because he was constrained by his understanding of the world around him, thought it maybe it's the the, the smallest seed. I'd suggest to you that's almost blasphemous. This is the Son of God. So how do we understand it? Well, maybe it was the smallest of the seeds that, that, that a sower would have sown. All the seeds, what, all, what qualify the word all for us? We don't know. Jesus was there. Maybe there were piles of seeds in front of him. And he said, of all these seeds, the mustard seed is the smallest one. We don't know, do we? And so I think we need to be careful before we start reading this stuff into the text. What, we, what do we know? That holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What did Jesus say last week when we, when we read it? He said the words that God gave him, they're the words that he spake. So God has said that this was the smallest seed. Is God wrong? No, he is the God of truth. And what about this one? This is just a quick example. You know, um, the four corners of the earth. Those that want to pick holes in the Bible will say, there you go, they thought the earth had corners. We now know the earth does not have corners. No, it doesn't. If, you, if this is relative, if you had a map, okay, and you were saying we're going we're gonna to get everybody in from the four corners, it's relative to, the, to that instance. It doesn't mean that that is error. It's relative to that situation. So we could go on with stuff like that. The biggest one, I suppose, is this one on demons. Of course, we come to uh, the, the Gospels and suddenly we read of all these demons. And we know from the Bible that, unlike the culture of the time, which, where these, these were suggested to be little demon gods running around causing problems, the Bible teaches very clearly that there are no rival demon gods. There is no God. I know not any beside me, says God in Isaiah 44 and 45. And Jesus himself says the only true God in John 17 verse 3. There's not these demigods running around. Do you think the Bible writers would know that? Of course they would. So God, therefore, we have to conclude, chose the language of demons when it came to explaining particular situations and miracles that Jesus had to do. This happened to also be the language of the day. But the primary thing I want us to focus on is, what is, the per- what is our understanding of Scripture? Is it that the authors were constrained by their understanding of the culture around them? Are you trying to tell me that Mark and Luke and the Lord Jesus Christ believed that there were pagan demigods running around the place when we see passages like this? I do not think so. So those words are there. They were compelled to to speak them and to write them on the authority of God. So we have to ask the question, why? And uh, 
the suggested answer that we'll give uh, very loosely and, and quickly this evening is that it has been pointed out, in fact, that God viewed Israel as being like people possessed and suffering the effects of pagan worship. And we can see that from the Old Testament. When you go back and look at demons in the Old Testament, it's always referring to paganism, to pagan gods. And so these uh, healings of people who have pagan, uh, who, who are behaving a certain way, are, we are being told, suffering the effects of false worship, of false paganism, so called. These, I would suggest to you, are recordings in this way as enacted parables. And yes, they're in a language that other people who are not well versed in scripture might associate with demons, like we might say, lunatics today. Like um, someone's been struck by the moon, that word means. We don't actually believe that. But of course, um, that's an expression that we use in everyday language. So there's some meaning there. But I wouldn't even go as far as to say that's the primary reason why God allowed those words to be used, because we know that the words are from God. And so I'll just give you a quick example. If you remember the madman of Gadaria, I think is Legion, you re recall in Mark that there are many, many links in the text back to Isaiah 65 about this man Legion. He dwells amongst the tombs. But there are lots of, there are, there are lots of passages um, in the account that link back to the Old Testament, speaking specifically about paganism in Israel. And so definitely we can say on the authority of scripture that God chose those words not to tell us that that's what the author was constrained to understand about diseases, but in fact to tell us that we should go back to the Old Testament to understand the divine meaning. Now, I'm going to save a bit of time and just say, if you want to know any more about that, Brother Mark and I have written a book, which I'm sure will be uh, available if you need it, or you can grab it on Amazon. I've got to move on. I'm going to be in trouble. Trust Brother Vic to be the one that steps in today. <laughs> of all the days. Um, I just want to go a little bit quickly on the front foot, because if we can't trust God on scientific things, why would we trust him on spiritual things? If we cannot trust God on matters of science, why would we trust God on matters of salvation? And many have lost their faith completely because of this line of reasoning. What about miracles? You know, we don't have... I, I've got a list of miracles up on the screen. You know, every scientific experiment that's ever been done has always shown that virgins never give birth. Every single time that can be, that can be scientifically verified. But we believe in the virgin birth. We do not believe that when someone has died, scientifically, we can resuscitate them to life again. And yet, our very salvation depends on our faith on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our very salvation depends on our belief in the virgin birth because he is the Son of God. And don't tell me science is not in the Bible. We would expect God, when he speaks about the world around us, to be accurate. You know, it says in Job, doesn't it, he hangs the earth upon nothing. The ancients didn't believe that. And there it is in the text. I've got loads of these. The, hydro the hydrological cycle, um, the surface of the earth. We've got ocean reservoirs. You know, it's only been later that they've dived down into the ocean and they've discovered that there is ocean reservoirs. Well, it's mentioned in Job. So there are things that were not in accordance with ancient mind revealed in the Bible, but the Bible isn't a science book. It is not a technical scientific book. And so, what's our perspective? Was the author constrained? Or in fact, um, were the words expressions and expressions the choice of God and deliberate? Any words that appear will be the language of the time to appear to be the language of the time are there by design of God and need to be understood in the way that God chooses them to be. Two different perspectives based on our understanding of inspiration. Now, we're going to have to r hurry along. We're going to do the Bible and historic facts, and I just make the point that we made last time that everything written in the Bible is written for a purpose. Not to record history for man's sake, uh, per se, like for his posterity, but written for our learning and our admonition. And so when we come across different passages, they're written for a reason in the way they're written. 
Now, it's been said that, well, maybe, you know, the, the penman who was a witness of these things was unfortunately constrained by their, 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 the viewpoint that they had, or maybe they've had it through hearsay, so when they wrote it down, there's errors in the text. And this is sometimes brought to bear. Um, in Luke 7, we have the, hearing of the, the healing of the centurion's servant. And in Luke, it says that the centurion sent the elders of the Jews. And in Matthew, it says, in fact, that the centurion spoke to him directly. And these are the same things. And if you, if you carry on, in the Luke passage, um, the centurion sends friends to Jesus and says, uh, which, and they say, trouble not thyself and, and various other things. But in Matthew, it reads as if the centurion himself was there and spoke the same things. So we have two records of the same incident and two different records, and it is suggested this is a contradiction. But I would suggest to you, based on our understanding of Scripture being inerrant, that these different accounts are not contradictions because um, we know the records are not, uh, are not untrue and are from God. They are a variation. They are not an untruth. They are not a contradiction. And so the answer to, to this one would suggest would be that, in fact, um, it was the centurion speaking, but he was speaking through his, um, his friends. And that's the answer to that complication. And, it, and so we just have to bear that in mind, that that's the way that these things have been recorded. What about this one? You know, David buys the threshing floor of Ornan, and in 2 Samuel it says he bought it for 50 shekels of silver. But then in Corinthians, uh, sorry, Chronicles, I always get them mixed up, it says that he bought them for 600 shekels of gold. So what was it? 50 shekels of silver, says the critic, or, or, or 600 shekels of gold. And the person who believes that inspiration was constrained by the understanding of the penman will perhaps lean on that and say, well, Samuel clearly got mistaken. He'd heard it wrong somewhere. But we believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, and so we would look around, would we not, for other reasons. A suggested reason is that the 50 shekels of silver was a down payment, and later the 600 shekels of gold was the full amount. That's a suggestion, but that is a suggestion in accordance with our understanding of this doctrine. We've got the problem of Jericho. You know, the historians and the archaeologists, they came along, they dug up Jericho, didn't they? And Catherine Kenyon basically concluded that, uh, that yes, it was fallen in and the walls fell in, but it happened 150 years before it was thought that Israel actually left Egypt. And therefore when they would have got there at the time that Catherine Kenyon thought they would have got there, there wouldn't have been a city there at all. So how do we understand that? Do we understand that, that this was a mythical story or that the author was confused, constrained by their understanding? No. We, if we believe in inspiration, would look around for another reason. Maybe the timeline is wrong. Maybe this timeline is not in accord, the, the timeline of the Bible is in fact not in accord with modern scholarship. And we've had David Rolls speak from this very platform on that subject when he came over from Spain, didn't he? Um, perhaps Kenyon, Catherine Kenyon was wrong. There's another archaeologist, Bryant Wood, who came along later and he said that she got it wrong and that she made mistakes, and in fact it was all okay. So the point I'm making, though, is that as soon as we doubt the text, we come into all sorts of complications, and actually there's other reasons why this, these things might be the case. And so we've got to remain open-minded but firm to our belief in the clear declaration of Scripture. All of the Old Testament, these are all passages here where Jesus has affirmed as historical fact something revealed in the Old Testament. The flood, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Jonah, there's loads of them, the Queen of Sheba. All of these things Jesus believed in as fact. Was Jesus wrong? Was Jesus wrong to believe in these things? The Bible presents itself as being factual, historically, and so I'd suggest that we should too. And so just to wind up those sort of thinking, was the author or the penman constrained or were the words and expressions the choice of God and deliberate 
any recordings that appear to be contradictory, we need to be considered in the light of verbal inspiration. There is the chance, of course, and we mentioned this last time, of a copyist error, or in fact, wrong conclusions by archaeologists or by ourselves. So, human sources. How do we explain, in God's word, references to external sources which were clearly not inspired? Um, and external sources anyway, like eyewitnesses. Let's just turn over to Luke chapter 1, because this is often raised in discussion around this point. Because it always reads like Luke. You know, Luke, maybe he, um, because he was a physician and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a man like that, maybe he just sat down one day and decided, you know what, I'm going to write this gospel. And I'm going to talk to all the eyewitnesses, I'm going to take their accounts, and I'm going to write it down. And in the prologue of Luke, verses 1 through 4, it does appear on the surface that that's what Luke is saying. So he says, this is the ESV's rendering, which um, is, is, is a rendering which seems to imply this uh, greatly. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us... It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now, just think about that logically, right? So, you're Theophilus, and Luke's saying, well, I've gone and chatted to loads of people and I've put that down. So that you can be really confident that this is right. Does that, does that square? Is that right? Is that really what Luke's saying? Or is this a bias in translation? I just want to raise something with you. Luke chapter 1 verse 3, it says here, it seemed good to me also, which doesn't actually mean that at all. It means I am minded. Um, it says that he had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first. And the word there, very first, is the Greek anothen. And it means from above. So what we're being told is, there's lots of people that have, have written stuff down, says Luke. But he was minded, having had perfect understanding from above, to write these in order. And so we see the Holy Spirit working with the author here, the perfect understanding. In fact, what does it say about the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit in John 14, 26? It says that he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And so this is an example of that outworking of the gift of the Holy Spirit in Luke, that he had a perfect understanding, a complete understanding in uh, these things from um, above. We could say more on that. I just uh, have to skip over. So it's not saying that Luke talked to eyewitnesses. It's not saying he went around talking to loads of people and compiled that as a historical document. It's not saying that at all. What about this, this one um, in Titus, where the Apostle Paul is inspired to write that, that even a prophet of their own, talking about the Cretans, said that the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow berry, bellies. This witness is true, says the Apostle Paul by inspiration. And we can go back in history and we can find that actually this prophet of their own was this guy, um, Epimenides. It's this guy. Um, and you can find there his quote um, from a 9th century Syriac commentary um, where he is recorded to have said this poem. What do we say? Do we say, was he inspired, Epimenides? Was he inspired to write that? Is this saying, is Paul saying that he's, because, he's, because it's quoting from there that, that we should go and look for the writings of Epimenides? No, I don't think so. We can't assume that just because there's a quote from an external source that that word was given by God. We can conclude that God chose in his wisdom to take that word and embody it in his word. <laughs> And that, ex and that it's true. The fact it's quoted does not endorse the entire source or the man. God chose to use this, reminding us 
that these words do have a cultural context. We're not denying that fact. This is a real word delivered to real people. It had a real, um, a real meaning to the people at the time. But it does not mean that they were, the penman was constrained by that at all. This passage emphasizes script, the scripture's reality, uh, relationship with reality. And we've got loads of references to books we don't have anymore, um, which we could, we could go through and, and look at if we had time. So, what's the perspective of external sources being embedded or referenced in the text? Has it, is it that the author chooses their own words and expressions and they're limited by their knowledge? Or is it, in fact, that they were deliberate and any extra biblical quotations are there by the design of God to illustrate a point he wishes to express in human terms? You know, I think it's like God saying, and even in the book of Jasher, which wasn't inspired, even there it will give account of these things, which we don't have anymore, the book of Jasher, but you see what I mean? So let's, uh, let's get down to our final point of consideration, <clears throat> which is perhaps one of the most sensitive. Because if God gave every single word and caused every single word to be written down, how is it then that, for example, we get Psalms which seem to express very personal thoughts and views? How is it that Paul can express what seems to be personal thoughts and views, and we'll come on to that in a minute. To answer that question, I think it's worth us just pointing out this fact, that it isn't just, just the words that are important. They are very important, but it isn't just the words that are important. The person that God chose to say or to write those words are important. The time in which that person wrote, the situation and the context all of those things become part of the divine revelation. In other words, the penman themselves is part of the message that they penned. And so it is helpful to understand where we can, from the text, understand where and who that person was. These men are not necessarily, as we've said, expressing their own views, but they might be expressing their own views. Let me just show you some things. Let's go on to one, uh, that, that passage that we had read with Brother Alan earlier, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, this is not a Bible class of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, a very sensitive issue of whether or not it is good to be celibate and to remain in an unmarried state. That is what 1 Corinthians 7 is all about, and it seems from verse 1 that that is what the Corinthians wrote to Paul about, the question of, is it good for a man not to touch a woman? Now, in regard to this, we have some very um, interesting things, because again, on a surface reading, it would appear, sorry, that... Paul is giving a personal view. So, if you look, for example, at verse 6, he says, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. In verse 10, he says, and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from the husband. In verse, um, in verse 12, he says, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. In verse 17, he says, he ordains it. In verse 25, he says, now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment. Now, is this saying that the Apostle Paul decides or is permitted or is allowed to inject his personal thoughts and views on this question? I'd very much suggest to you it is not, although that is how some people read it. What, in fact, is going on here is that when he talks about a commandment or instruction of the Lord, he is referring back to what has already been revealed about this question in the Gospels, and particularly in the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 5 and Matthew 19. And Paul is giving added further revelation, further details in relation to this subject. And so that's why it says, for example, in verse 25, now concerning virgins, 
I have no commandment of the Lord. He hasn't got an instruction from Christ in the text that he can turn us back to. But he says, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. And that brings us back to his calling and his apostleship and the gift of inspiration that we had, that he had. And if we're in any doubt that that is not the case, look at verse 40, because at the end he says, and I think also that I have the Spirit of God. And so that is the explanation to this difficult passage. And it's important that the Apostle Paul was chosen to be inspired to write these things. Firstly, because the Corinthian Ecclesia wrote to him, and so it's nice that he, uh, you know, in God's mercy, was able to give an explanation. But also the fact that he was and had remained unmarried. He may have been married, we're not sure. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, and they had to be married to be part of that organization. But, so, but definitely at these times, he remained unmarried. So it was important that he was inspired to write stuff about being unmarried. Because people could connect with that, particularly the people in that day. And this comes back to the point that the prophet was also part of the message. The experiences which the prophet had were no doubt based on God's work in their lives, and they're relevant to the text. But at the same time, you see, so, so when we go through the Psalms, we find that's the case, but at the same time, they're relevant to Christ. Um, they're not just accurate recordings of the opinions of people. So we could go through just very briefly the, the, the prophets in the exile, Ezekiel and Jeremiah. They're the prophets that got the, the most glorious pictures of the kingdom age to encourage them, to encourage the faithfuls in their age. But why? Because in their time, there was no kingdom. It had been destroyed. They were in exile. So isn't it fitting that in the broad sweep of history, God chooses those men to reveal his truth to? Daniel reveals the truth of the prophecy of the kingdoms of men in Daniel 2. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar was being called by God. It was important that Daniel was the one who revealed that at that time to Nebuchadnezzar. It wouldn't have been any good if Paul had done because Nebuchadnezzar would have lived and died. And we can see from the record that that is the case. Um, David, he'd done that terrible sin, you know, Psalm 51 that we looked at on, on Sunday with Brother Phil. Um, he'd done that terrible sin. And so he is compelled to write something which may or may not have been the words that he would have used. We know this is the sentiment of David because in 2 Samuel we read that David says to Nathan, I have sinned against Yahweh. And so this psalm seems to fit with that sentiment because it takes place at this specific time after Nathan the prophet came in unto him. But as I showed you last week, it says in Samuel that the spirit of Yahweh spake by the psalmist and his word was in the psalmist's tongue. So mysteriously, paradoxically, we have the experience of the person and we have the word of God being given to them at that time. Maybe these expressions were what David should have been feeling, and they're the perfect expression of that. Maybe they were what he was feeling, but as I say, we can only go on what God has revealed about his word. I haven't really got time to go through this. Psalm 16 seems to be a personal expression of the psalmist but in fact in Acts 2 it's not talking about the psalmist at all thy holy one to see corruption it's talking about Christ not the psalmist and so um, we could use other examples Isaiah 8 seems to be the personal expression of Isaiah but in fact when we go to the New Testament it's not, not to do with Isaiah it's to do with Christ's view of the saints uh, and, and the followers that were given to him in Hebrews 2 as we say, when a prophet speaks, even if they say I, if they're under inspiration, it may not always be the fact that it's directly being compelled to speak something specifically about them. We have this uh, delicate subject of the imprecatory psalms. These are psalms which evoke judgment, calamity, or curses on other people. And it's been suggested that, you know, this is not the expression of God's truth. This is the opinion of the psalmist, because God is a God of love. 
you know, Jesus says, love your enemies. And yet here we have these expressions of what would appear in modern language to be hate speech. Are these inspired or are these just the, opinion, uh, the opinions of the psalmist? Well, Psalm 5 is quoted as a fact in Romans 3 by inspiration of God. Psalm 69 certainly is an imprecatory psalm. It talks about their table becoming a snare. It talks about a trap. It says, let their eyes be darkened. These are the enemies of Israel that they see not. Pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Are these God's words, brothers and sisters? Do we believe that these words were penned by the psalmist under inspiration and that they are breathed out by God? If that's the case, then these are the these are the, this is the mind of God. And I'd suggest to you that it is the mind of God because this psalm is quoted in John 15, in John 2, in Romans 15, it's quoted in John 19, it's quoted in Romans 11, and it's quoted in Acts 1. All of those New Testament prophets quote this psalm as fact and as the mind of God. So what's our perspective? Well, we have to think about that. We have to balance the severity and, uh, and the truth of God with his mercy and his love. And we need to look at passages with discernment on the principles revealed to us from the word, not trying to inject our thoughts and damage what the Bible has actually proclaimed about itself. So has the author chosen these words and expressions or in fact... Are these the choice of God? And any personal expressions which appear to be there, be there by design of God because the author is part of that message. So in conclusion then, I just want to kind of finish up with um, with this. We have a choice to make, don't we? You know, whether we believe the, 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 the evidence that we brought forward in our first study, that this is, all these words are here by the will of God, or, in fact, whether there's some error and human uh, error has crept in somehow in the process of inspiration. There's various things. There's natural inspiration. That's where somebody, uh, where people believe that there's no supernatural element at all and that the Bible was written by just great religious men who often erred, but they had a great understanding of, of, of spiritual truths. We have conceptual inspiration which is where the one mainly we've been focused on, because I feel it's one of the most dangerous, which is where the thoughts and ideas of Scripture have been inspired, but then all of Scripture has been constrained by the penman who's put it down. And so there is, say, the people that believe in this factual and scientific error, because the author was constrained uh, in their penning of it. Then we have partial inspiration, which, of course, historically our community has um, had to deal with the idea where parts of the Bible is the word of God and parts not. Um, And so we have to uh, try and figure out which bits are and which bits aren't. And, of course, um, there could be error in the Bible, according to that view. And then we've got the verbal plenary inspiration, which we've been promoting and which Christadelphians have always believed since our conception And then right at the far end, the extreme is this idea of dictation. And hopefully today I've shown you that the author is part of the message. And so it's not like there was a typewriter somewhere just tapping out the words that were given. Sometimes God compelled without any, um, it seems, uh, significance um, for that person to write those words because there's always a relevance to the person chosen Balaam for example it was relevant that he the false prophet was compelled to say the truth why because he was asked to curse Israel so God compelled him to in fact bless Israel and so there's meaning behind those things so there is no chance of simply a typewriter being used but verbal plenary is where all the words of the Bible are inspired and without error but there is some relevance to the penman that has been chosen. And so I'd just like to end by saying we have no need to tear down this doctrine that we have of inerrancy of Scripture. We can have confidence in the truth of the Bible, and there is nothing that should make us doubt that if we come at the Bible and believe what it claims as opposed to injecting our thoughts and man's thoughts 
on its pages. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. 